Good evening. I'd like to give a special welcome to members of our Global Village Museum, members of the Global Society, uh, donors, supporters, and friends. My name is John Roberts. I'm a founder and a member of the Board of Directors. And this tonight is our first of several planned Zoom programs sponsored by the Global Village Museum for play and for using during the COVID crisis the pandemic. Tonight, tonight's talk by me is called Global Service and then some, and this is our first endeavor. So hopefully the any glitches and Zoom issues that can be kept to a minimum. And if we are a little glitchy, you'll give us uh, some credit and forgive us, please. Uh, tonight's uh, will be, uh, um, this is the same night as uh, Barack Obama and Kamala Harris are talking. So we promised to end this particular Zoom talk by eight o'clock. So those who wish can watch the rest of the uh, convention from the Democratic National Committee. Tonight, I'd like to share some of the artifacts and art memorabilia that are in the museum and that are in my home and share, share some global stories that I've lived over the period of time that I served in the Foreign Service, which was uh, some 37 years worth of time. I think uh, you'll see a pattern in some of the stories. They, a lot of them are what happens universally, where uh, life experiences in different countries, different cultures often revolve around food issues and language problems. Uh, and there, some of them are humorous, and I think you'll find them interesting. So let me begin. You'll see this lovely orange bowl. Uh, pretty oranges, pretty colors. Uh, I was a graduate from Fort Collins High School and I went through high school not interested in anything international. I took no languages whatsoever. But when I went to the University of Colorado Boulder, I was required to take a language. It was at the time that uh, we were interested in Russia as a nation. So I took Russian and worked really hard at it. When I finished my first semester, I went to get my grade. The grades were posted on the door of the professor and I was a blank. There were three of us that were blanks. I knocked on the door, she was there. I said, my name's John Roberts. I took your class. I thought I did really well. I don't have a grade. She had a Rolodex. She looked at it. She rolled her Rolodex and she said, ah, if you don't take the second semester, I will give you a C minus for the first. Well. Needless to say, I quickly changed languages and then got another semester uh, put in for French. So after a, fr a French semester and a Russian semester, as you can tell, I was an absolute superstar when it came to languages. This is a picture uh, that was in our museum. It's a world map created by a Dutch cartographer in 1599. Uh, he did a pretty good job with Asia and some of Latin America, Africa. Uh, but in 1599, they weren't sure what the Americas looked like or North America. So you can see it's a little bit blank. Uh, this is an indication, not only did, am I of Dutch ancestry, so I like the Dutch map, but I studied international studies at the University of Colorado. And uh, early on in uh, my sophomore year, I became a people to people student ambassador. Uh, traveling to Europe, staying with families in Berlin, in Hamburg, both in Germany and in Edinburgh in Scotland. Afterwards, I rented a, a Volkswagen and I was traveling in the Neckar Valley of Germany. And I had a room on the second floor of an old bachelor, uh, US bachelor officer quarter that had been an old mansion during the German times. And it was now a small hotel. So I stayed in this room. It was a corner room, it was very hot. I opened the windows and next thing I knew a bat had flown in the window and was literally dive bombing me in the room. There was an old heavy German telephone on the table. I dialed zero. The man at the desk downstairs answered and I said, excuse me, I need help. There's a bat in my room. Well, if you speak German, you know that bat means bath. So he said, ja, all zimmers mit bat. All zimmers mit bat. I realized I was not getting through to him. I ran downstairs, 
uh, used my hand, showed him the, what I meant. And he says, ah, das Fledermouse. So he ran with me upstairs. He got a broom. He beat the crap out of this poor bat and swept him out of the room. And I was no longer bothered by a bat. But all Zimmers mit bat, especially in German. I, uh, in addition to my German, or in addition to the Dutch background, I'm also a very great of mongrel because I have some background in Germany, ancestors from Germany, from Bavaria, uh, also from the Celtic regions, uh, from Ireland, and from Wales. So you put all that together and uh, you get a mongrel. One of my favorite pieces of art is this tile from Holland from Netherlands, it says, which means very clearly, if you have nothing to do, don't even think about doing it here. Very, very touch. And because of that, you know how industrious, hardworking the Dutch are. They're almost frenetic. And I've got a little bit of that in me. They are, they consider themselves active, driven and productive, but sometimes it's just ridiculous. Uh, how they go through life. This is another part of my little German heritage. This is a Bavarian clock. Uh, Germans uh, are stubborn. Uh, I've been known to be somewhat stubborn. And in addition to that, I'm also a Taurus, which are very stubborn people. Um, after I, um, after I was, uh, in my first year at the University of Colorado was 1960. On the campus that day in October of 1960, a candidate for president showed up on the campus. His name was John F. Kennedy. He was walking on the campus meeting students with one bodyguard. I shook his hand, talked to him. Subsequently, I was very impressed by him, by the way. Uh, subsequently, he went to the University of Michigan, gave a talk about an International Service Corps idea that he, that he took from Hubert Humphrey. And after his election on the 1st of March, he signed an executive order to establish the U.S. Peace Corps. Uh, and it was a very interesting subject. Uh, I followed it. I was a student of international studies. And in my senior year, in November 22nd, in fact, he was assassinated in Dallas. At that time, I pledged myself to try to join the Peace Corps six months hence when I graduated, and I did. And I went to Somalia. Um, so that's how I started off my foreign service career. And um, so before we go on my more services of the foreign service, I'd like to show you a few gifts that have been given to the Global Village Museum in the, find, you can find them now in the uh, Village Arts section. This is a um, pretty interesting, I think uh, there's a, a Brazilian balanganda, the thing hanging down at the bottom is uh, made of silver. They are not trinkets, but they are artifacts comprised of silver. And each, in the slave time, beginning in the late 1600s, when slave ships showed up in Salvador, in Brazil, uh, the slave people would, would create, because they found silver, would create a, an amulet, an amulet to wear around their neck. So here you see there are pipes, there's a cashew nut, there's a pineapple, there's things and over the period of time that families were formed, they would collect these from various members of the family and put them together on a silver chain, as you see here, to ward off evil spirits from a family's home. This is uh, from the early, uh, early 17th century. It's very valuable and somebody came in and gave it to us and said, we want you to have that. So that's why we have it. There's also, as you can see, uh, a portrait that's made out of leather and uh, pounded gold, which is a portrait, uh, fictitious of course, of the last emperor of the Incan Empire. This is Atahualpa. You can find both these things in the village arts part of our global village. Another gift that were given to us was from a lady who had been a uh, archaeology student at Colorado State and she and her teacher went down to the Peru and on the coast. And these are pre-Incan drinking vessels, sacred drinking vessels by the Moche people. Uh, they date back to from 500 to 1000 BC. They're quite old and she had a whole box full and she said, I want the museum to have them. Well, we were stunned and we contacted the, the, the embassy of Peru. 
offered to return them because they were collected in 1950 and 51. They said, no, we have so many of those, you keep them, we're glad you're displaying them. So luckily, if you come into the museum, you can see these huajos that come from uh, Peru. Also in that particular exhibit, you can find this, these statues, carved statues of the three major tribal people, men of Nigeria, which is the, the largest uh, and the largest populated state in Africa, one of 58 states. Uh, these represent the major tribes. The one on the left is Yoruba, which you can find in the major center part of the country and towards the central coast. There's an Igbo on the right, which comes from the land of Igbo, the, the area that was in uh, rebellion against Nigeria. And then on the far right is a Hausa, uh, an Islamic part of the country, uh, warrior-like and tall people. So these three lovely statues you can find right there. Also in this uh, section of our museum, you can find this lovely, lovely carved Japanese dragon from a Zen Buddhist monastery temple. One of our sub-founders was Stuart Price and he worked for 40 years as a teacher in Japan, teaching at the American International Schools and the military schools. And he was watching as they were tearing down the Zen Buddhist temple. He went in and he said, what about that dragon? What are you gonna do with that? They said, we're throwing it in a, in a junk pile. Would you like it? He said, absolutely. So he's got this uh, dragon that he get gifted to the museum. You can see that from a Zen Buddhist temple near Edo, which is the old capital, Tokyo of Japan. And lastly, this uh, is a very nice uh, vase, uh, ceramic vase, very heavy. It's chrysanthemum. You can see some of the celestial kingdom. It's Chinese. It comes from the Silk Road area of China. How we got this is very interesting because there was a gentleman who was the foreman of the Chinese crews building the Union Pacific Ra Railway in 1867. And they were based at the time in Denver, building the road across the Rockies. And the Chinese gentleman came into the Trinity Methodist Church in downtown Denver and asked to talk to somebody because he wanted to study to become a Christian. And uh, so he, they taught him uh, something about Christianity. He joined the church. After he became a Christian, he brought this vase in and handed it to the superintendent of the Sunday school and said, I want you to have this. Well, three generations after that was given to the, to the person at the church, a friend of mine had it. And when he passed away, his wife brought it in and gave it to us and said, we want you to have this lovely Chinese vase that comes from the Silk Road. It has a lot of meaning to the family. And now, of course, it has great meaning to us at the museum. So as we begin my life adventures, uh, uh, Foreign Service, John's Foreign Service, and then some, uh, these two artifacts come from Somalia in the Horn of Africa, the east coast of Africa. The one on the left is a carved uh, tree that, that is a water jug that is for, used for prayers, Islamic prayers, before you pray, the symbolic washing of the hands and the feet. Uh, and the one on the right is a child's toy. It's a, a carved camel, somewhat primitive as, as you can see. But I was, that's where I became a Peace Corps volunteer. That's where I started my, my basic life. Uh, I was teaching at a boarding school in the country. Uh, I was teaching young men from the ages of about 12, 13 to 22. Myself, I was just 21. Uh, I had really no background in teaching these those who came to the school were the eldest sons of camel herding nomads that wandered in the desert around in Somalia. Uh, at this school, there was nothing growing, nothing to eat. Uh, they had grain millet called uh, laho that they would take and pound and make pancakes. And they'd fry pancakes for morning, noon, and night for three meals or two meals. It was just morning and night. And then they would uh, take uh, sheep, they raised uh, sheep with fat tails. They would cut the fat tails off the sheep. They'd boil it down, making a kind of a ghee uh, called uh, anogel, and, uh, or so called subag. And they'd pour this ghee on top of the pancake, and that was our meals, morning and night. No vegetables, no, nothing really fresh. And so consequently, I lost a lot of weight. 
Uh, I went in at 176 pounds, I think, when I started. I was 133 when I finished my Peace Corps service. But on Friday, sometimes, if an old camel had died, we would get some camel meat that was very tough, hard to eat. And occasionally, two or three times a week, they would milk a camel, and we'd have camel's milk. That was called anogel. Anogel uh, was kind of disgusting because if you had it when it came right out of the camel, it was a bit warm, and warm milk is not my, my strength, I think. But if you let it sit for an hour or two, it turned sour very quickly. So it was either sour or hot. That was my diet. Um, one of the things, uh, oh, one other thing about food is I had no contact with my family. When we went in 1964, we were told that the Peace Corps would contact our families if anything untoward happened to us. Uh, and they would be able to go, someone would go to Kenya and be able to make a phone call. Um, I had nothing else to eat, but my mother felt sorry because she got a word that there was, we had a surfeit of, a surfeit of food. So she sent me for my birthday in April, a bag of, of dried, freeze-dried applesauce with a package of, of uh, sugar and cinnamon that went with it, that you just had to put water with it and boil. But it didn't arrive till Christmas, even though my birthday was in April. And when I got this package delivered by the Peace Corps director into the school where I worked, I was so excited and I started cooking it over a Prima stove that I had. And the smell of this applesauce cooking uh, wafted through the school. About 12 teachers showed up my front door and said, we want to, what are you cooking? It smells so interesting. So they invited themselves in and we sat around in a circle and I took the applesauce off the stove and I served it uh, on small plates, 12 different places, just a dollop each one. One by one, they took this applesauce and spit it out saying this tastes terrible, we're not eating this. And I sat there with my little dollop and ate my dollop, but that's all I had. It was a bit sad. The other thing, one of the things that re reminded me of at my service in the Peace Corps uh, was I taught every subject you can imagine. I taught geography and history and math and English and science and I was a coach for basketball. Uh, I had never taken a science course. Uh, I had a, I had a America, a, an Encyclopedia Americana. So I was able to keep one step ahead of the children uh, from the school by the syllabus. And one of the things that came up in the syllabus was dissecting a frog. We had no frogs. And the students decided that they could dissect an, uh, uh, a small um, dick dick, which is a small antelope. It looks like a very small uh, kudu or uh, uh, something very small. It was about a foot and a half high, about a foot wide, uh, and they caught one in the desert, and they tied it up and put it in the in the principal's office one morning, and announced to the whole school that Mr. John, the science teacher, was going to dissect this in front of the whole school that, that afternoon after school was out for everybody. So they brought it in, and this poor animal had died of rigor mortis, or it had was rigor mortis. It died of fright. And I know nothing about science, so instead of able to drain the blood, I cut into the dick dick and blood sprayed everywhere in the room, all over me, all the students, all the teachers, to much uh, consternation. Uh, and as I was pulling things out of this bloody pulp mess of this small antelope, um, I had no idea what I was looking at. So I would pull out a heart and say this was probably the stomach or the lung or the intestines. Um, I had no idea what I was doing, but everybody enjoyed the uh, show that I was able to do. One other time in Somalia, I crossed the riverbed. There was a dry riverbed that ran by the school. I crossed it, and as I'm wandering in the, in the, in the desert among the thorn trees, I heard this loud noise. I looked up, and a 24-foot high water, uh, water bunch of water coming through the tug. Uh, it was called a tug. And it was a flash flood in the, in, the, in the dry riverbed. And I couldn't get back across. And it flowed and flowed and flowed, taking trees, goats, sheep, anything that was in its way, it poured through. The students at the school could see me on the other side of the river, uh, could do nothing about it. They asked me to sit down, spend the night. They would try to keep watch. 
I had no flashlight, no torch, no nothing. Uh, there were hyenas uh, in the behind me through the night. I could hear them. But in the morning at first dawn's light, the students formed a chain across the river, uh, holding hands across. And they got to me and pulled me across in the chain back to the other side. And I was saved from the flash flood in the dry riverbed. One of, the, one of the most memorable occurrences that happened to me as a Peace Corps volunteer, there were seven of us who decided to go ourselves on a trek to East Africa. So we took a ship, uh, we, we flew across to Aden, got on a ship and got off in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And then we took a train back to Moshi, which is at the base of Mount Kilimanjaro, and we rented two cars, a Ford Anglia and a Ford Cortina, which were both uh, British Ford cars, very small. One of them had four people in it, and the one I was driving had two other, two ladies and myself. And we got separated because we stopped uh, as we came around through Uganda and Kenya and into Tanzania at the base of Uganda, Lake, on the top of Lake Victoria. Uh, unfortunately, we were separated by a day and we'd agreed to meet uh, at a lodge in Serengeti National Park. Uh, as we tried to go in the next day with no food, no water, no nothing, the, the game ma ranger said, you can't make it with a low lying little car, a little sedan we had, you need a four wheel drive. But we said, well, did our friends come through? Are they, did they come through yesterday? And he said, absolutely. We said, well, we're gonna follow them. So we went through, no map, no nothing. He said, keep to the track. We were driving along, we came to a, a shallow river so the girls got out, I got out, we made a bridge with stones across the river. I drove across just fine, it worked out fine. But we came to a fork in the road and I went to the left instead of the right. I had no clue, we drove and drove till we were almost out of gas. We came to a village and we were informed that the village was outside the park, but for $8 a gallon, they would sell us gas. Well, they took all the money we had, we bought a tank of gas, went back into the park, made the turn, by this time it was beginning to get dark and we came to another village inside Serengeti National Park. So we stopped and asked these villagers if there was a place we could stay. They said, sure, you could sleep on the floor of the school. We had sleeping bags. So the three of us laid our bags down on the floor of the school and they decided to have fun with us. So they all decorated up in some war paint with torches and spears and ran around the school, hooping and hollering, hoping to scare the heck out of us, which they did very nicely. Uh, so we slept not a minute all night. Next morning we got up, we were starving, we had nothing to eat, although they gave us some water. We took off again, we, uh, we went about a mile and had a flat tire. So we checked the spare, it was also flat. So we had to take the spare and the tire back to the village, which they patched up for us. We brought them back, put them on the car, took off again. We got another mile or two and we came to another river, which was deeper than the first one. So we made our, tried to make a rock bridge uh, going across. Unfortunately, the car got hung up on one of the rocks. I think I was a bad driver. I got off the trail there. Uh, took the uh, bottom of the car, which was the whole exhaust system, and the muffler off the car, left it lying in the river as we went across the river. So I had to go back, retrieve that. We had to take the, the suitcase off the top, the suitcases off the top of the car, put them inside, and we had to, we had to tie with a rope the muffler and the exhaust system on the top of the car. Well, then we were afraid we'd be asphyxiated by carbon monoxide, so we had to leave the windows open. Unfortunately, there were tsetse flies, so the girls had to use newspapers and magazines to try to keep the tsetse flies out of the car or hit them when they got in, and I was driving. We sounded like a tank going through the jungle. Animals, giraffe, other animals were running in all directions away from us, impala, but we, were, we kept on track. We came to another river, we, which we crossed quite nicely. The trouble is that the wet caused the brakes to go out. So then finally we came to a ravine and the, the ravine, I geared down the car, grinded the, down the car to stop the car with our stuff on top of the car and full in the back. I said, okay, hold on for dear life. We're gonna go down the ravine, small river at the bottom. We're gonna go up the other side and we'll be okay got three quarters of the way up the other side, the car died and I had no brakes. So one woman who was quite concerned, she opened the door to jump out and she jumped out, but a big rock took hold of the door and ripped it off the car, 
which I had, we had rented. And, and the car went down to the bottom of the ravine and just sat there with water up to the floorboard. I got the other lady out of the car. Um, we, they climbed the hill. I geared the engine. I got the engine going, um, revved it up and went to the top of the hill, got to the top, went back to get the, the door, which was on the side of the hill. And we, we tied that to the top of the car and we drive along and we come to a man and a woman who she's quite pregnant and he has a bicycle. He lays his bicycle down on the road and he begs me to take his wife to the lodge that she works there and he works there. He said it was just a couple more miles. So by the, we're on the second day of this trek, uh, this safari. I asked if she knew the way to the place. He said, yes. Turns out she spoke no English. Uh, we had no space for her, but we got her in. I was afraid she would be delivering during the time of the car ride, but she didn't. Uh, we came to another fork. I asked her, do we go left or right? She just nodded. So we went right this time and we limped into the uh, lodge area after I had already driven over his bicycle, which he laid in the center of the road. And I smashed his bicycle up and I said, sorry. And we just kept going. We got to the lodge. Our friends had long gone. There was no space. They were sold out. They gave us some porridge to eat put us in a room with three uh, bunk beds. We slept each of us for 26 hours. When we got up, the poor man at the lodge had wired the door onto the car. He could do nothing with the muffler and exhaust system, which was still tied to the top of the car. We limped into Moshi after our trek through Serengeti. The man said, what have you done to my car? I tried to explain. He felt really sorry for me and for us. He said, I won't charge you. You're just young people. That was a horrible experience but it was very memorable, I promise you that. So that was our trek to uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania as Peace Corps volunteers. This is a temple dog from 1968, from uh, the tomb of Tuduk, who was an emperor of the Nguyen dynasty. He was the second emperor. Uh, this is near Hue, the old capital city in central Vietnam. It's a good memory of my time in Hue serving in Vietnam. I spoke Vietnamese. Uh, when I had gone to the State Department after Peace Corps, they took me in because they were looking for fodder, I think, for cannon fodder to go into Vietnam, representing the U.S. government and the State Department, non-military. I became a refugee resettlement officer, uh, helping people who were displaced by the war uh, by passing out tin roofing, cement bags for reconstruction, and bags of rice to sustain people. Um, and then they would have another problem and the US would bomb the villages and then the people would have to move and we'd do it again. So thank goodness at least we were trying to keep people going. My, my life up in Hue was uh, interesting. I was all over the province, uh, traveling around the province. Uh, there were Americans, a lot of Americans, but a lot of Vietnamese. I had a Vespa motor scooter, which I could ride on the top of rice paddies. So I got to see a lot of the province. It's a beautiful area, actually. A lot of problems with food. Uh, I was not very fond uh, and I had many Vietnamese friends. I also taught English as a second language at the local high school in the evening. Uh, but I was not fond of eel, which is cooked in a pot, a clay pot, whole eel. So when you open the pot after it's cooked, there's the eel floating in with a little head bobbing around and you eat the whole thing. I was not overly fond of 90 day duck eggs, which as just before they're hatched, they're taken away from the mother, put in the ground, they're, they're, they've stayed in the ground for 90 days, and then they're heated up and you can pop them into your uh, mouth. Uh, these are all called, also called balut, if you were in the Philippines. Uh, I was not fond of whole sparrows that had been cooked um, and their heads were crunchy and uh, uh, the little little skulls and beaks were not overly appetizing. But I struggled through and tried to eat everything. I didn't want to offend anybody. So when I finally had a chance to put on a hamburger fry for all my friends and all the people that had helped me, and I cooked hamburgers, they looked at this hamburger and they said, uh, what's that? And I explained to them what it was. And they said, we're not eating that. And nobody did. So I I'm, was kind of sorry that I worked so hard to, to eat the food that I did. But I loved working in Vietnam. My two children were um, adopted from Vietnam. 
this is a Vietnamese dragon. It's a watercolor. It's on my wall in my home. The dragon represents uh, the male as the phoenix represents the female. The dragon is a symbol of strength and virility. It also is the symbol of Vietnam because if you look at a map, when you combine North and South Vietnam together, the head being the southern part of Vietnam, the Cal, the Calma Peninsula, you look all the way, the tail goes all the way up to the far north and borders China. So uh, the dragon is an important thing. Uh, when I worked in Saigon after Vietnam, after in Hue, settling refugees, I worked for uh, the government, for the State Department in rebuilding some hospitals and some schools. At that time, the American Secretary of State, or Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, came to Vietnam. And he'd studied some Vietnamese because he wanted to make a speech before the Vietnamese parliament. And he wanted to say, Vietnam will live for a thousand years. Vietnam Mung Nam. But instead he said, Vietnam Mung Nam, which in a tonal language has a totally different meaning. Vietnamese, by the way, has six tones. If you say the wrong tone, it has a different word, different meaning. So instead of saying Vietnam lives for a thousand years, he raised his finger and he said, the sick duck wants to lie down. Well, the, di the diplomats in the room looked at each other. The Vietnamese parliamentarians looked at each other. Turns out maybe he was more prophetic than we knew because this was in 1970. Maybe the sick duck did want to lie down. After my tour in Vietnam, which I loved, we were transferred, my wife and our two kids and I were transferred to Indonesia. This is a duck that comes from the Javanese court from the Majapahit Empire, which is probably in the 15 and early 1600s, uh, just prior to the arrival of the Dutch. Uh, this is from a kraton, from a royal palace. It's a painted duck that represents the splendor of the Majapahit Empire in, um, in Java and also Indonesia. One of my great stories from living in Jakarta, living in Java, uh, was uh, during that time in about 19, 72, the uh, students at the American International School had found uh, drugs uh, and it was a shame and the, the drugs, the drug culture was high. So we at the embassy decided we could do something about it. We take an embassy house and, and raise money to build a youth center. So after school, the kids would have someplace to go rather than get into trouble. To raise money, we wanted the American Chamber of Commerce and other people with money to come and the ambassador's wife agreed to host a luncheon to be honored by the, the chairman of honor or the honorary chairman, which would be the wife of the president, Madame Suharto. So she came and we had a big luncheon set up. It was to be Indonesian food with, uh, we were gonna have saute. And when you eat saute, your fingers can get a little sticky. So in front of everybody was a finger bowl with some limes floating in it. And as we sat down at the table, I was sitting next to the, the president's wife and next to the ambassador's wife. Uh, and the, the president's wife picked up the bowl of water, which was not boiled water, so it probably was not very good to drink. But she picked it up to drink and she brought it to her mouth to drink to the gasping of all the people at the table of 26 people. Uh, Mrs. Uh, ambassador took the bowl out of her ha mouth basically took it right out of her mouth, rang the bell, frantically, two servants came in. The ambassador's wife said, oh, this, I have a new chef. This soup is dreadful, it's awful, it's just watery. Take this soup away, Mrs. Suharto. But the, and then the, the waiter said, but Madam Ambassador, that's not soup, that's, she said, take this soup away and take everybody's soup away. So we were all saved from drinking diseased water and Mrs. Suharto was as well. So that was a really good thing. Good to happen. Also, uh, one of the things I did in Jakarta as we were raising money for this uh, particular student house, uh, streaking was very popular in the United States. So I was picked on uh, because the chairman of the fundraising committee to streak through the embassy on a given afternoon. Uh, streaking through the embassy would not have been a very diplomatic or uh, advisable thing. And the ambassador heard about it on the morning of the streak called me in and said, what are you thinking? What are you going to do? I explained why we had to do it. He said, how much money do you still need to raise from the streaking? 
I pointed out to him we needed $300. He said, well, here's $300. Now you will not street. And thank God, because I saved the reputation of the embassy in front of all the uh, Indonesian employees. But it wouldn't have been a pretty picture, I can assure you of that. This is a shield, a, a symbolic shield from the Dayak people of Kalimantan, uh, which is the large island of Borneo. Uh, it has with it on each, either side are some dancing spears, which are also symbolic. After we arrived in, uh, in Indonesia, my wife and I left the children with friends, the two kids we left, they were very young, and we went to, uh, to S Malaysia. Uh, we went to Sarawak for a three-day holiday. We arrived in the town of Kuching. We got a hotel room. We were walking in the marketplace of Kuching. Uh, about 11 o'clock in the in the morning and a young man approached us and he had long ears where he had, they pierced his ears and they hung down. He was wearing a Dayak costume, young man of about 16, 17 years old, practicing his English. He asked us uh, some questions and he said, would we like to visit his family's longhouse, which were very famous uh, hanging out over rivers. We said, sure. We said, how do we get there? He said, there's a taxi, a, a river bus, We'll take that, he'll take us up and we could stay, we could see his family's house. So we get in this thing about noon and we're traveling up river. We have nothing, again, nothing to eat, except we did have a pack of peanut butter cookies, I think in our pocket. So we get on this river bus and we're traveling and traveling and we're about four and a half hours in. It's starting to look like it might get dusk very soon. And my wife asked him, how are we gonna get back to Kuching, the capital city? And he said, oh, Every three days, the river bus turns around and comes back the other way. Well, that was very surprising for us to hear and my wife started to panic. Uh, there was not much we could do at that point. So we arrived at this long house, which was a house holding about 50 people. It was hanging out over the river. Uh, they helped us get out of the boat. They helped us in a notch log to get up into the long house. And uh, they said, okay, it's getting dark, it's time for dinner. So you will sit here and we sat in a big circle and we shared a meal you were to eat with your hands. They brought out a, a bowl of rice, wild rice, that had been, uh, been and, and it had on it uh, some pork, wild pork. And this wild pig uh, was probably a couple days or a couple weeks old. It was gangrened, it was quite green, and it was moving around on the plate because the maggots were there. And I said to my wife, we cannot eat this, we cannot touch this. Uh, but we didn't know how else to do but to take a handful and rather than put it fully into our mouth, we tried to shove it through the bamboo slats of the longhouse and would hit the water below. You could hear it splat. Everybody knew that we weren't eating. They gave us a glass of water, which they pulled out of the river with little things floating in it. You could see little, little animals in it. We couldn't drink that either. So as we neglected to eat their food, my wife was mumbling under her breath. She had to get out of this place. They said, okay, it's now dark, it's time for bed. Uh, the women all sleep in the longhouse. The men sleep out on the porch, uh, the open air porch, which we tried, but I was being eaten by mosquitoes. They finally gave me a, a sheet to wrap up in. The next morning before I knew it, I was taken to the uncle of the man, the young man who brought us there who, by the way, was the only one who could speak English. So he had to be with me at all times for me to ask any questions. But the uncle who was the chief of the longhouse had decided that I was worthy to become a blood brother of the longhouse. And I've been the only Western visitor ever to show up there. So they brought me over to him. My wife was fuming in the background. He cut, he took a knife out, cut my wrist, cut his own wrist. We mixed our blood together. This is pre HIV, by the way mixed our blood together, I became a blood brother. At this point, my wife came over and she said, I'm going to jump in the river of piranhas and swim back if you do not do something now. I told the young man that now that I was a blood brother, we desperately had to get back to Kuching. Uh, he saw on the other side of the river, about three quarters of a mile across, a, a river boat and he got, he took his shirt off, started hooping and hollering, waving his shirt, jumping up and down, the boat literally turned and headed towards us. It barely got to our little dock. And my wife was on board before you could say Jack Robinson, not even thanking our host for a lovely evening. I thanked the uncle, I thanked the young man. We, I said, we have to get back, so sorry, goodbye. 
uh, it took us back in three and a half hours back down the river. Uh, and the next day when we went back to Jakarta, Indonesia, my wife went to a marriage counselor and we started three years of some difficult times for my extra trip that I had taken. It wasn't my fault. Just, just pointing that out. The, uh, by the way, that, that shield and the sword were a gift from the chief as a blood brother of this particular tribe of Dayaks who had been cannibals early on. This is a, a, a gong from a gamelan. Gamelan meaning a, an orchestra, a Indonesian Javanese orchestra. This is the bass gong, beautiful piece actually. It's from the 15th century. It comes from uh, the Kraton of uh, Surakarta. Uh, it has special spirits in the dragons that are carved at the top. So it's a kind of a totem. Uh, a very important piece. You can find this at the museum, but you can't play it because it's, not, it's pretty old. Um, one of the things that happened there, and you can already found out that I was in a lot of trouble with a lot of people a lot of the time. One of them was with the ambassador's wife in Jakarta. Uh, the first ambassador we had was the one that helped raise money for the school. She, they were great. The second ambassador that came, his wife uh, was not uh, as cooperative for everything. And she, we used to have a program in Jakarta uh, for newcomers to the embassy. There was a large, it was a large embassy. And so a husband and wife team would be invited to the ambassador's residence. There would be three or four couples. Uh, they were there for pie and ice cream uh, on a given evening to talk about the culture and mores of the culture of Indonesia and history and uh, some rules and regs from the embassy. It was a social evening sitting around the living room, but the ambassador's wife did not like hosting it. She didn't want anybody in the residence. She was not to be bothered by that. So the deputy ambassador's wife had to do this. Well, that was all well and good, except that uh, the ambassador's wife would come and she'd make a very small speech, welcoming everybody and saying that the res residence of the ambassador was the residence of the American people. And because we were all Americans, we were welcome there at all, anytime we wanted. And she literally looked at us and she, it's not Spanish speaking country, but she looked at us and said, mi casa es su casa, which if you speak Spanish means my house is your house. Well, one evening, a friend of mine and I had probably too many beers and we decided to go visit our house. Uh, so we went to the residence and knocked on the door, rang the doorbell, the head uh, uh, Major D or the butler came and he said, Madam Ambassador, Mr. Ambassador are out for the evening. I said, I know that's okay. They wanted us to come in and have a drink. So could you please uh, bring us a beer and we'll sit in the living room for a few minutes uh, because they told us we could stop over. So we're drinking our beer and the door opens and the ambassador and his wife walk in. And she walks over to us and she says, what are you doing here? And I said, uh, su casa es mi casa, no? And uh, she was not amused. And I got into some more trouble, as you might, might imagine. The next slide shows you some uh, puppets from Java. These are Wayang Golik. Um, the first guy over there is uh, uh, Arjuna with the, in the, he's in the middle with the blue face. He is a giant. He's got a snake around his neck. Um, Rama is on the left. He's the good guy in the story from the Ramayana of good and evil. Uh, and he has to rescue his wife who's been kidnapped by uh, Arjuna. So Rama is on the war path too, and he needs help. So he uses the monkey king to help him and the monkey army to recover his wife, Sita. So these are picture, or these are puppets, uh, and they're called Wayang Golik because they're, Wayang meaning puppet, Golik are real life uh, puppets. Um, while I was in Jakarta, uh, I had a friend who, his name was Dimitri, and he and his uh, wife had children our kid's age. I met him at an embassy reception. Apparently he was KGB and he assumed that I was CIA, which I wasn't, uh, but he was pumping me all the time for questions about the American assistance program uh, to Indonesia, the military assistance program, which I knew nothing about. Uh, every time he would question me, I was asked to report to the, our ambassador, and I'm sure he was writing up everything that I was saying to him. Most of it was absolute nonsense since I had no clue what he was asking. But he and I would play tennis together, and because we couldn't speak Russian or English, 
uh, either one of us uh, together, we could use Indonesian because we both spoke Indonesian, which he, I had studied, he'd studied. The ball boys at the Olympic tennis court thought that was great, that the great Russian bear and the ugly American eagle, me, uh, could only speak to each, to each other in that international universal language known as Bahasa Indonesia, which was funny. But he invited me one afternoon, one evening to the Russian Revolution reception, the October Revolution, which was held in November because the, the calendars had changed no longer on the Julian calendar. My wife didn't wish to go. And so I went uh, and uh, they were drinking vodka out of large glasses, no ice, no mixer, just vodka one after another. And when he wasn't there, uh, the others couldn't speak Indonesian and I spoke no Russian. And suddenly I was surrounded by three Russian thuggish looking guys, very large guys, who started pushing me in the chest and pointing at me and saying, when tanks? I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. They said, tanks, when tanks, you know. I said, no, no, I have no idea. I don't know when tanks. I don't have anything to do with the military assistance program. Well, they picked me up, pushed me against the wall, raised me up and shook me and said, when tanks, when tanks? I said, I don't know, I have to leave. They said, tanks, gobble, 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 gobble. Oh, I said, Thanksgiving? Yes. They wanted to know when Thanksgiving was. I said, it's in two weeks time on Thursday. I have to go home now. My wife and my children are missing me. Thanksgiving, when thanks. There's some more artwork from Indonesia. These are masks that come from Bali, which is a Hindu island and from Java, which is today a Muslim island, uh, Islamic island, even though at one time it had been Hindu, it had also been uh, Buddhist. If you ever get a chance, the temples at Prambanan, which is near Yogyakarta, they're Hindu, uh, Hindu origin. The Borobudur temple, the great temple in the center of Java is of Buddhist origin. Uh, so uh, the masks are very important because they represent the culture. And if you look, the guy on the right is that same guy Arjuna, uh, who is the, I'm sorry, he's, I'm sorry, he's Rama with the red face. He's the good guy. And the one on the left is the monkey god, Hanuman. One of my jobs out of the embassy in Jakarta, and would you believe I'm second from the right there, doesn't look much like me today, because this was a long time ago. Uh, I was the advisor, the American embassy advisor to the domestic peace corps, the, the, the peace corps of Indonesia. They had taken the concept of Peace Corps, and I'd been a volunteer, but they'd taken it and they changed it so they would bring in 10 to 12 uh, volunteers from a village, say in Irian Jaya, or in Kalimantan, or in Sulawesi. And then they placed them all together in a village in, in Sumatra, or in Java. Uh, very interesting concept, because all 12 of these kids would, would, would bring with them their culture from another island, they would work with the people of a single, another island and everybody would be coming together. In fact, uh, the, the motto of Indonesia is Veneka Tungo Ika, which means unity in diversity, very similar to I Pluribus Unum from many one. But from unity in diversity is the, is the motto of Indonesia, which is a nation of 7,000 islands spread over 5,000 miles of the South China Sea. And it has a population today of over, well over 200,000 people. It's the largest Islamic Muslim nation on earth. Anyway, we're in a village and the, the guy who I was the advisor to was a guy by the name of G.W. Napitapulu. He's there pictured with me. Napi, which was his nickname, was a Batak. He came from the northern part of Sumatra from a, an area around Lake Toba, which was a volcanic lake. These people were fierce warriors hundreds of years ago and cannibals as well. And uh, in the middle of the 1800s, they were converted to Christianity when missionaries came uh, to teach them. They're well known for their singing like Welsh, Welshmen are. Uh, and he was the head of this whole Peace Corps. Uh, you can see our safari suits, that's what you wore. And even with the <laughs> bell bottom bottoms we had. Anyway, he and I were good, became friends, G.W. Nappy Tapulu. And one day over a bear, again, over a beer, I said, your parents must have loved you very much and they must have loved America because your name, G.W., stands for 
George Washington. He said, yes, it's George Washington Nabitabulu. I said, why would they name you George Washington? He said, you don't know this, but I have American blood right inside me. I said, you have American blood? He said, yes, my great, great grandfather ate the first American missionary to come to our people in the Batak area. American blood indeed. As I was leaving Indonesia, and I'd also been an advisor to the city of Jakarta, the capital city, which was a very large city uh, known as Batavia under the Dutch times, uh, the governor of Jakarta wanted to give me a gift in a, in a glass case. And it was this lovely sailing ship, which is constructed from clothes. You can see the same kind of clothes you'd stick in your ham at Easter. Uh, the rigging on the ship is made of these clothes. The whole ship is closed and there are people manning the top of the ship. This would be a ship that the Dutch, like the Dutch would have taken into the spice islands to collect spices, hence the clothes. Well, he gave me this gift and uh, as I'm, we're all packed up, we're ready to go that, that evening and I couldn't take this thing in the, on the plane. So my boss uh, at the embassy said, okay, I'll take it and I'll mail it to you. So he took it and he forgot to mail it to me. I forgot about it. Uh, 30 years later, 40 years later, he calls me from Atlanta and he says, I have this box, do you want it? So I said, absolutely. So he sent the box. We opened it up at uh, 10 years ago at the Global Village Museum, 10 years ago. You could smell the clothes. We opened it up and of course the glass was all broken everywhere, but the ship is still intact. And you can find this ship in the Global Village Museum in Village Arts part of the museum. After I left Indonesia, uh, I was assigned to Washington at the State Department, but my first sub-assignment was to go to Nepal. I went to Nepal, and this is a tanka. This is a painting done by Buddhist monks uh, of a mandala, meaning the four, the four wind, sun, sea, all of those things, plus the four senses of direction. And it's called a tanka, T-A-N-K-A. A tanka, or T-O-N-K-A, it represents a Buddhist teaching. So that's what this is. Uh, it's a sacred art painting. When I was in Nepal, I was in Nepal for a few months. Uh, we worked on some reforestation of the Nepali hillsides. I can remember going with the ambassador and the ambassador's wife on a trek. We waded through jungle and some small streams, climbing into the Himalayas. Uh, and there were leeches in the trees that would hear us and sense us and drop off. So we checked each other repeatedly for leeches, small leeches that would be uh, dropping from the trees as they would drop on the ax or any cattle that would be around. And as we're walking, the ambassador's wife had on some tennis shoes with little holes, uh, holes for air on the, on the bottom side of the, the, the tennis off to the stream and she said, I think I've got water in here. She took, she sat down on a rock, took her socks off and they were filled, her feet were filled, the socks filled with blood because the, the leeches had got on her pant legs, climbed down, gone through those little eyelet holes in the shoes and were feasting on her feet, which we had to pull off and clean her feet up with some water, dew from the grasses so we could continue our trek into the mountains uh, to look at uh, those things. Also, I worked in Sri Lanka for a, a couple of months. Uh, the first day I got there, I got there late in the evening. I was taken uh, to a hotel about three blocks from the embassy. I got up in the morning, walked over to the embassy. Uh, there was a guard in front, a uh, uh, Sri Lankan guard. I said to him, is the embassy open yet? This was about at a quarter to nine. He shook his head like this. I said, oh, okay, well, when does it open? He shook his head. So I said, okay. So I went back to the hotel. About an hour and a half later, I get a phone call from the embassy. He says, if you can't sleep all day, are you not coming into the office, into the embassy? I said, I was there, but you're closed. He says, we've been open since eight. Turns out that I didn't know, but in Sri Lanka and parts of India, when you do this, it means yes, the embassy was open. My head wasn't open. Uh, one of the great uh, projects I worked on there was the embassy was monitoring the rebuilding of a canal system. Under the ancient times in Sri Lanka, uh, going back to about uh, 800 BC, the Sinhala people 
had built a huge irrigation system of grand canals with secondary and tertiary canals so they could grow rice in the center of the island of Sri Lanka. By the way, Sri Lanka was known as Ceylon early on. It was known as Ceylon by the, uh, by the Dutch and by the English. Uh, but even before that, when the first Westerners came around the Horn of Africa and passed this particular island on the tip of India, they called it Serendip, meaning surprised to see this island. Serendip, of course, is the root of the word serendipity. So you can see where this comes from. But the people, the majority of people in Sri Lanka today are Buddhists. And there are also Hindus, there are also Muslims and Christians. But the majority of people in the old Sinhala kingdom were uh, Buddhists. And they built this system of irrigation and it was the finest irrigation system in the world at the time. Well, it went into disuse for over 1,000, 1,500 years. The US government decided that one of the things they could do to help Sri Lanka rebuild itself was to rebuild these canals. So the canals were under construction, they were cement, and then there were secondary and tertiary, and a lot of training was provided to Sri Lankan people, farmers on how to use the canal system and open sluice gates and so forth. But one of the things we worried about, this was in the early mid 70s, uh, was uh, the elephants. There were Asian elephants wild in the center of Sri Lanka. And these canals being rebuilt were crossing through the elephant areas and the elephants could not cross these large main canals. So we built tunnels and the tunnels about every six miles were for crossing of elephants. They were elephant underpasses only used for elephants. And I know for a fact they're still operating today. The irrigation system re redone as it's still operating and the elephants are using the underpasses. It's gratifying to see something that we worked so hard on working today. After uh, some other assignments in Malawi, in Kenya, I was assigned to Egypt. And I had my tour in Egypt. I was there for four and a half years. I loved Egypt. I, this was, uh, I, went, I first went there in 1980. Um, this was a painting. I, I, as I wandered through the bazaar quite often, the Khan Khalili in Cairo, fascinating area. There, it's like a labyrinth inside. I, I wandered into this home of a, apparently a, of a very rich Islamic person from the old days. He had an iron gate that was wide open and had fountains working in that right sitting now on the fountain, sitting next to the fountain, was an old gentleman painting pictures on a cardboard box, a four-sided cardboard box, actually six sides. And one of the sides was this gentleman that you see, this painting that was painted with oils on cardboard. And I stood there and looked at it and I, I wandered from side to side. These are, this is a painting where the eyes follow you wherever you are and he can see you. It's the inscrutable Sheikh. And the man said to me, you like that painting, don't you? And I said, I do indeed. He, I speak some Arabic. I learned Arabic, by the way, I, we, after coming from high school with no languages, today I speak nine, us play igpe atenle, plus pig Latin, if you got that. Anyway, he cut out, uh, he took a knife out, cut this box out, uh, took the side and just handed it to me. He refused to accept a, a cash offer. So I took this uh, painting home, framed it. It's one of my prized pictures, the inscrutable Sheikh from uh, Cairo. In uh, 1981, during the celebration of Eid, which is 40 days after the end of the, the fasting of Ramadan, uh, people will sacrifice an animal uh, to represent the sacrifice of Ishmael or the sacrifice of Isaac and Abraham. We know the story from the Bible. Uh, same story we have, Islamic peoples have. Uh, and you usually you do a sheep or a goat. But if you're rich, you, you can do a cow or something larger. Uh, I went, we were invited to go to have, to take uh, lunch at the embassy doctor's residence on the Nile. He was in, a, in the eighth floor of a 10 story apartment building. And as we got into the building, the elevator was out, as was often the case in early 80s in Cairo. Uh, we had to walk up the eight flights of stairs. As we got up to the sixth flight, there was a terrible commotion going on in the hallway of the sixth floor. And unfortunately, they had taken a camel six flights up the stairs. And the sacrifice for this relatively well-to-do family was to be sacrificed a camel. 
and they had slit the camel's throat. The camel was throwing itself around in the hallway, bleeding profusely down the steps, down to the next floor, uh, and blood was splattered all over the hallway. I think the sacrifice that they had planned to do, this family, didn't work out that well for them. And it certainly was a mess trying to get to lunch two floors above that. Uh, I'll never forget that. Also, uh, spending four good years, uh, there's a part of Egypt that's Coptic, that's Christian, that was brought by St. Mark uh, right after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And this is a triptych uh, that would be used in a religious ceremony. So there's a, a painting of the mother and child, and either side are two monks, two desert fathers who founded the desert monasteries, the ancient monasteries of Egypt in the first, second centuries. Uh, that's uh, St. Anthony and St. Macarius. Uh, those monasteries are still working today. Of course, there's the Dove of Peace and, can and candles. Uh, there are about 15 or 16 million Christians in Egypt uh, living alongside Muslim Islamic Egypt. And uh, they live fairly peaceably together, although there's been some tension, but it's a very diverse society in, in Egypt today and has been for years. Um, uh, before I leave Egypt, maybe we go back. I wonder if we go back one slide, go back to the cops. Thank you. Um, I was there when Anwar Sadat, who had signed the peace treaty with Jimmy Carter and with uh, Menachem Begin from Israel for the first peace treaty between Israel and Muslims uh, in 1981, uh, causing anger and rancor among the troops of Egypt and the people. Many people were unhappy with it. And Anwar Sadat was assassinated in September of 1981 as he reviewed troops. Uh, the embassy was thrown into an uproar. The country was in an uproar. Uh, four, five presidents came to his funeral, which was the, the assassination was on a Thursday. On Saturday, the funeral was set um, at the same site where he was killed mainly because there were some hotels there uh, and the uh, memorial was already had been built for the unknown dead and for the heroes of Egyptian life. And uh, because Menachem Begin was coming from Jerusalem, he was to arrive uh, on Friday night and he could not uh, take a car on Saturday, which was uh, the Islamic holy day, uh, the Sabbath, so he could walk from a hotel that was near the grounds. So it was held out there. And the US Embassy had, uh, had rented an entire hotel to keep our delegation. And our delegation consisted of President and Mrs. Nixon, President and Mrs. Ford, President and Mrs. Carter, President and Mrs. Reagan. Uh, and I was a, a messenger between the mail room or the room for messages, the radio room, down to the cafeteria before on the morning of the funeral. And all four of these presidents and their wives were having breakfast together and asked me to sit down and ask me questions about what life in Egypt and what it was like to be at the embassy. Uh, it was an amazing uh, experience to have breakfast with these four people. Um, I didn't have enough sense to get any uh, autographs on a napkin, but it was a funeral after all, probably not an autograph taking session. But later in the day, as we're walking through a hallway, I'm walking side by side, Dan Rather from CBS, news and uh, uh, President Nixon was passing him and they were not friends, they were actually enemies. And Nixon grunted and nodded and Dad Rather grunted and nodded. And we went past and after the president had passed, uh, Dan Rather looked at me and he said, who was that masked man? That was Richard Nixon. Okay, the next painting is a painting, an oil that comes from Haiti. This is Joseph, Joseph coat of many colors. We know that biblical story from the Old Testament, how Joseph was sold by his father, or sold by his brothers, taken from his father, thrown into a, a pit, uh, was pulled out by a camel train, taken into Egypt and resold. Uh, Joseph uh, could interpret dreams. He became an advisor to the Pharaoh. When there was a great drought, drought and famine in, uh, in Israel and Judah, uh, the brothers uh, came to Egypt and there was Joseph welcoming them uh, and kept them for years, invited them to come and live and be in Egypt because there's seven years of drought and famine. Of course, these people became the people who were enslaved by the Pharaoh eventually after several years. 
and then who fled in the Exodus outside of Egypt to go back into the area of, of where Israel is today and Judah and back there. But this is a painting of, uh, with a, the model being obviously the concept being Haitian, uh, which is an island, of course, just to the south of Florida. Joseph and his coat of many color. As I worked in Dominican Republic, which is on the island, shares the island with Haiti, the island of Hispanola, I got to travel a bit. Uh, the painting on the left is the watercolor from uh, the colonial period of uh, Guatemala. You can see the Spanish influence, the gate, the pension or something in there. Uh, you can see that watercolor. And then on the right is a painting also post-Spanish, but it's of a village, probably Cusco in Peru. You can see the llama, you can see the Peruvian houses, you can also see the balcony and the houses of a Spaniard, and you can see the church steeple there with the cross on the top. You can see the influence of Spain uh, on the Peruvian countryside as well. Uh, in, while I was in the Dominican Republic, uh, a very interesting uh, assignment. This, uh, this water, this is a pastel painting of a flower vendor in the market in, in uh, Santo Domingo. Uh, she's selling calla lilies. It's a striking painting, one of my very favorites. While I was there, I had an appendicitis. Uh, I was in rushed, I had a burst appendix. I was rushed to a hospital where I was uh, given some, um, some medicine uh, so they could operate on me. I was allergic to it apparently. They had to beat my heart and beat me back to life. Uh, we suffered a hurricane right after that. I slipped in the water. We had a flood in the house. I slipped, my kids were there. I opened the wound of the appendicitis things and got infection. Uh, driving back from work one evening, uh, I was accosted by a man who threw himself in front of my car late at night. Uh, and he was an acrobatic guy who threw himself over the top of the hood. I stopped the car, got out. He was fine. He took my arm and twisted my arm behind me, saw my ring, stole my ring, stole the keys, took the glasses off me, threw the glasses across the road uh, and started to take the car. When a car went by, a man stopped. He was a priest, a Catholic priest, Dominican. The guy got on his motorcycle and ran uh, with my car keys uh, and uh, the priest took me home. Uh, we called the embassy, we called the security office. I wasn't hurt badly, uh, but I was scared. Uh, I got an extra set of keys, he took me back, I got my car. Unfortunately, the guy on the motorcycle was hiding in the bushes, followed us home, he knew where I lived. He tried to extort money from the embassy and from me. Uh, and, and unfortunately also, he was a bodyguard for a guy running for president in the Dominican Republic. A, a guy who uh, was favored as a candidate by the Americans, so no charges were ever filed, uh, but it was a frightening uh, experience. After the Dominican Republic, I was sent to Botswana, which is in the southern part of Africa. Uh, it's the republic that's just to the north of South Africa. Very interesting place. Uh, and as the British, the British, it was a British protectorate, along with Zambia and Zimbabwe and, uh, and South Africa before it became uh, a republic of its own. And the British uh, had arranged to depart, leaving Botswana in the desert, the Kalahari Desert to itself. And just at the very time they were leaving, they discovered fantastic diamonds. So Botswana was very wealthy. And subsequently Botswana has used its money for development of schools, hospitals, roads and infrastructure. Uh, in the Okavango Delta, which is a uh, inland delta of, uh, of swamps that wild animals abound uh, of the Okavango River that comes out of Angola, uh, there's a lot of butterflies and somebody, some enterprising uh, person uh, of a tribe, uh, probably uh, the people in the Okavango, Okavango Novembo tribe have made, have taken out butterfly wings and made this painting. It's a shame to lose the butterflies, but it certainly is a beautiful painting. And there is an abundance of butterflies, so I guess, I guess it's okay, I'm not sure. Uh, so that's butterfly wings. Botswana is the home to the San people, 
of the Kalahari, that's the Bushman. Uh, this is a, a miniature quiver with small little arrows made out of porcupine quills uh, and a little pouch uh, and a little bow that's probably about a foot and a half long. And this is a matchmaking bow. This, uh, if you're wondering, it probably predates uh, Tinder, it's pre-Tinder. Uh, and if a young man uh, sees a young lady walking in the village or in the desert that he takes a fancy to, he can take out one of these quivers and shoot her in the buttocks uh, with this quiver. And uh, it, will, it won't hurt her, it won't stick, but it will hit her. She'll realize she's been shot. She turns around and takes one good look at the gentleman. If she is interested in him, uh, for some matchmaking, she can pick up the quiver, uh, pick up the arrow, the porcupine quill arrow, and hand it back to him. If she doesn't like him or is not impressed with him at all, she can break the quiver uh, and walk away, and he has no recourse. He cannot follow her. But should she give it back to him, he may follow her. Nice job of matchmaking. Uh, it seems to work for the San people of the Kalahari. This is a electric lantern, so to speak. It's an old uh, a, a gas, not gas, but oil, a oil can, cooking oil can, that's been fashioned into a little lantern. Uh, during this time of the growth of the country with diamonds, the government announced that they would be trying to electrify in the Kalahari along the road, a ring road that they were making in the desert, a ring highway. So the people in the, in the general stores could find these electric light bulbs. They had no idea what it was or how you use it. And so they would take the insides out, put kerosene in and a wick and station this bulb inside this little lantern and light it with a match. And then they have an electric light and they called it the electricity was coming and here it was, they had this. Uh, when I was there, the first electric uh, stoplight, the first stoplight appeared in the capital of Habaroni and for three days, you couldn't drive your car in the center of town because as the light, the stoplight changed from red to green and yellow to green, yellow to red, uh, whatever, people were standing in the middle of the streets with their mouths open watching this light being able to change on its own a stoplight in the capital city of Habaroni. Interesting. Also, while we were there, we did a lot of camping. We did camping in the Kalahari. And the center of the Kalahari is a little game reserve called Kutsi. Uh, and a group of eight of us or nine of us from the embassy went camping one long weekend. It was the President's Weekend in July, which is a time of year quite cold. In, in fact, water left in a bowl outside your tent will freeze. Uh, we had drawn straws. I had fed us the first night. We went camping and set up our tents. There were four tents and nine people. One tent had a couple, a young couple with two little girls. My tent was by myself. I had a, a small dome tent. There was two other families, two other couples that had been longtime campers, longtime residents of, of Botswana. We were all sleeping. It was a full moon. There was suddenly a noise outside. I thought that the man who had pulled the, the straw to fix breakfast the next morning had been up and he was clumsy and he knocked over the table. But no, it turns out that there's a screaming coming from the tent at the far end where we camp, saying there are four lion in our, in our camp. And then I heard a crash and a rip, and then I heard more screaming, and this woman said, we're going to be eaten. Please help us run quick. So I, so I was, I, everybody else was snoring. I sat up in bed. I couldn't believe my ears, couldn't believe my eyes. There was a full moon out, it was quite bright. She said, hurry, hurry. I said, I'm trying to find my shoes, which was a strange thing to say, but I had these sandals and there was thorns and rocks. And I, if I was gonna get out in this, in the lion den, I had to have my shoes on because I had to run to the car and try to get to them. So uh, she said, you can go to hell with your shoes. I said, easy for you to say. Uh, I got out of, the, out of the tent, unzipped the tent. I dare not look at these four lions, four big lions surrounding their tent. I ran to my car, which was to the right, off to the back, probably about 20 yards away. I was sure I was going to trip. I was going to fall. I was going to break the key off in the lock. The lions were going to eat me, but it would have been a diversion. I got in the car safe uh, in my underwear, and I turned the wheel, turned the engine on, turned the wheel. Unfortunately, my hand was caught in the, in the steering wheel column and the steering wheel, and I ripped the fingernail off my left finger 
which was excruciatingly painful. But I got the car turned, I got the bright lights on, started honking the horn and saved these people by driving the lions uh, about 50 yards into the, into the bush area. I turned around and came back, got the people in the car. It turns out what had happened is the people had an old fashioned tent with uh, aluminum poles on either side that was holding the tent up and the tent was suspended under the poles. The lion, when they had come back to their place where they laid down under these thorn trees, had brushed against the pole. One of the poles had fallen over, hitting the back of one of the lions. One of the lions that got hit reached up with his claws. He scratched at whatever it was attacking him. He got the tent wide open and these people are right inside. Uh, because one of the things they tell you in, in Africa is if you're in a tent with a zipper up, you're safe. Well, not unless the lion open it up. So these people, I got them out. We, we got the other people with the two little girls in the car as well. It was a Land Rover, Land, land Cruiser. Um, and, uh, and then we got, tried to get the two people that were snoring the hardest, the, the old dowagers that, of the place they knew camping better. They refused to wake up. They refused to believe there were lions in the camp. We finally convinced them. We were all in the, in the car together, all nine of us. And uh, they wanted to go see where the lions were. Well, we drove. 50 yards into the, into the bush. We saw the lions, they turned tail, they didn't run. They just sauntered on to the on, glaring back at us. We went back and decided we had to all sleep in our cars because the lions were in the camp. And over the night, uh, this was at about 1.30, 2 o'clock over the night, the last four hours before dawn, the lions had come back into the camp. They had taken the gentleman whose camp was, whose tent was under attack, they took his video camera and his video camera case, carried that into the bush. They carried my downfilled jacket, which was a L.L. Bean downfilled jacket, which was on the, just outside my tent on a chair, on a camp chair. And they took those two things. And then they came back and they chewed into three of the four tires of this guy's car, his Land Rover. And they were all flat. You could see the teeth marks on the Land Rover. So when we woke up at six o'clock in the morning, uh, the first thing we had to do was get all three cars and get the, thank goodness, all three cars had open or had, had good spare tires we could put on the Land Cruiser. We drove out to see where the lion had been, noticing that we were missing things. My downfield jacket, as you can see, I now have it framed with pieces that were left, cloth and feathers. Uh, that's all that was left. Uh, we took pictures of the of the camera case and the camera that had been chewed up. He brought that back. Uh, when we got back to the, when we were traveling back to the, to the capital, we stopped at the ranger station and told them, yes, they said yes. They knew Lion had been there. They had been thirsty because there had been a drought. We told them we had children. They should have warned us. They said, sorry. Uh, we were pretty perplexed. We got back to the capital the next day on Monday, uh, working day, I went in and told the head ranger of the national park, a friend of mine, I said, uh, we had this happen to us. He said it was my friend's fault uh, because they were exuding hormones of fear when the tent had been opened up. I said, well, if you had happened to you, you would probably exude, and to me, I would have more than hormones of fear. Uh, I would exude more than that. Uh, he laughed and thought that was quite funny. Subsequently, I wrote this up in a little report which we printed in our embassy newsletters uh, throughout Africa. And it got picked up by the New Yorker in 88 or 89. And apparently somebody wrote a rebuttal saying that I was lying, that I wasn't. It's a true story. This also comes from Southern Africa. This is a man. He's made, he's carved out of, uh, out of ebony, interesting, the wood of ebony is uh, dark, you can see black wood, and the outside bark uh, is light wood. So this is a carved man, he weighs about 220 pounds, very heavy, uh, got to bring him back with my household effect. I could trade him to bring back from Botswana, uh, or I could bring a couch. Uh, I brought the man and left the couch. So that, that works. Um, after Botswana, I was assigned to Liberia. Unfortunately, this was the time of the beginning of the Civil War, and Charles Taylor, who uh, was decided to attack the capital of Monrovia, 
and get rid of the Afro, uh, the Li Libo Liberian Americans um, or Amerigo Liberians who had ruled the country since 1837. Uh, he surrounded the city. People were starving to death. Um, they, uh, my mother had died. I had left uh, all my valuable things in the embassy safe, which had been blown up. That part of the embassy had been destroyed. The dogs I had left there were eaten because people had to eat food. They had to strip the trees, eat the leaves, eat the bark. Uh, so after just two weeks assigned as the deputy ambassador to Liberia, uh, I no longer had a job. I no longer had a car or a, a house or animals or some artifacts. So uh, subsequently I got assigned and I was assigned to um, Madagascar. Now Madagascar is on the east coast of Africa. It's the fourth largest island in the world. It's got the most fascinating of flora and fauna you can imagine. It has lemurs. It has wonderful people that came in the fifth century on rafts from Sumatra, from Indonesia, when they didn't like the idea of having the Muslims take over their uh, Hindu empire. So they fled on rafts and they crossed the Indian Ocean unknowing where they were going. And in the fifth century, they bumped up against the island of Madagascar in the Indian Ocean, which is only 50 miles uh, or 250 miles from the coast of Africa. And 50 million years ago, it actually floated off if you know your plate tectonics theory. And so it, it developed with no people and animals such as lemurs and all of the animals that went 50 million years back on the continent of Wandano land. So one of the things, uh, the culture that formed was a culture of Asian people in, in the, on the edges of Africa. Uh, subsequently, in various years, they've mixed with Africans, so the people are a mix of people. But one of the Asian customs they brought with them was to bury their dead in a tomb and bury all the family in the same tomb and put them on shelves in the tomb and put the tomb about three, four, five kilometers away from the village, wherever they lived, and every seven or eight years to open the tomb and take the bodies out. It's called an exhumation. In English, in, in Malagasy, it's called, uh, it's called a famadiena. And I was invited to attend this. These are scheduled when the eldest woman in the family, the, the oldest woman, decides in a dream that it's time to take the ancestors out and show them what's happened in the village. And it's a very celebratory time. So everybody in the village, uh, they save money for seven or eight years. They take the doors off their houses in the village. They put them on sawhorses to make tables. The whole village walks three or four or five kilometers they form a band, the band plays, they bring pelicans and they bring white claws uh, and uh, you go to the tomb and I, there's a picture of me there with my hat dancing in front of the tomb and then they go in and they take out the bodies one at a time because I was a foreigner, I was invited to take out great, great, great grandfather and he's wrapped in a white cloth called a lamba that's held together with safety pins. And the last time he was out of the tomb was eight years prior. So this was uh, in 1981. And because I was a foreigner, I was asked to take down great, great, great grandfather. So I brought him, they put him in my arms and I take him outside the tomb into the sunlight and wrapped in this cloth that was falling apart because in eight years and the dampness, uh, it had eaten away. And unfortunately his skull fell out of the wrappings and hit the ground and went rolling down the hill. Uh, I was sure that I was gonna be speared. I mean, what have I done? But they thought it was all so funny. Many of them laughed so hard they rolled on the ground. The children were running after great, great, great grandfather and brought his skull back and shoved him back into my bag. And then after everybody's out and all, and these bags falling apart, they lay them one at a time on blankets or on white claws and they throw, poor people, throw them up in the air uh, to air them out and so to wake up the spirits of the dead, all from the same family. And then they put them on the pelican. You can see I'm having to wear a special hat that was woven for the occasion to carry the dead body, which is wrapped just a set of bones and skull back to the village, which we put, then we place them on the houses they lived in on the front porch. And then everybody gathers around the table and we drink palm wine and eat food. Uh, rice and meat and 
uh, chicken and so forth, a, a great event that lasts for three days. And they, every day they put the, the, the bodies back on a, on a pelican and walk around the village to show the spirits how many more villages, how many more villagers there are, how many children there are, how many new houses there are, and they put them back on the porch every night. When the three days is done, they wrap them in brand new claws with new safety pins. Everybody's wrapped together. They take them on the pelican back to the tomb four or five kilometers away. I was asked to put him back up on the top shelf facing to the east and all the bodies were put back in. They seal up the door with cement and bricks. Everybody's sad because they won't see ancestors. They won't co-mingle. They won't join their ancestors for another seven or eight years. But what an experience, a three-day experience it was. That's called a uh, Fama Diana. Uh, and it was uh, quite, quite the experience. Uh, from Madagascar, uh, I was transferred to the Ukraine. Ukraine was, um, this was right after the Soviet Union had fallen. Uh, Ukraine needed to have a new embassy set up. We had no embassy. The government of Ukraine took the Communist Party headquarters after the revolution, after the fall of the wall, and gave it to the American embassy. Uh, my office was uh, up on the third floor with a, a statue of Lenin. Uh, and a card catalog of all the former members of the Communist Party in Ukraine. Uh, we had we put up a flag on the flagpole in the front of the embassy. Every day that flag would be stolen because people wanted American flags. So we ended up putting the flag on a on a, a broomstick and hung it out of my window on a broomstick by putting the window down on top of the broom part so that the flag just hung over outside the window. They couldn't steal it from there, so we could keep our flag because we didn't have enough flags. But one of the things I remember there was strange. Uh, we had a we before we had housing, uh, we had a hotel, and in the hotel at each end of every hallway was a babushka, an older lady who sat there on a chair with a notebook, and she had a bucket of toilet paper that she would take out six or eight uh, sheets of toilet paper. When you came into the hallway, she'd get up and bring you that toilet paper to take you, excuse me, to take to your room, and she'd give you a light bulb to screw into the light fixture in your room. When you left the next morning, you didn't have to return the toilet paper, but you did have to return the light bulb. Uh, and it was a, a strange situation. One evening it was raining and I, I got a, back from the embassy, I got a ride with a taxi, woman driver and a very small, old-fashioned Russian car, a Lada, I think it was. Uh, and I, she, she, I told her which hotel, and she dropped me two blocks from the hotel in the rain. She said I had to get out there. I said, no, no, I'm paying you to drive to the hotel. Please take me to the hotel. So reluctantly, she did. And we drove into the portico of the hotel out of the rain. I got out, paid her, got out, and went inside. And suddenly, there was a commotion. I turned around outside, and four men had dragged her out of the taxi and were beating her up. I ran to get the manager at the, behind the desk at the hotel. I brought him out. I said, they're beating up this woman. He said, it's her own fault. She has no business here because like all hotels in Kiev at the time, controlled by the mafia, she was not a member of that mafia. They resented her bringing a passenger into their territory.